You're listening to the B&H Photography Podcast. For over 40 years, B&H has been the professional source for photography, video, audio, and more. For your favorite gear, news, and reviews, visit us at bnh.com or download the B&H app to your iPhone or Android device. Now here's your host, Alan Weitz. Once upon a time, B&H decided to produce a first-class photography podcast, and unbeknownst to me, they thought it'd be a swell idea to have me host the show. Since I already had my shoes and socks on, I decided to give it a try, and after a few practice runs and a short list of tweaks, we hit the air, and it's been uphill ever since. We've had some incredible guests. Our topics are broad, eclectic, addressing aspects of photography from gear to technique to history and art. Everyone we've invited onto the show, regardless of the topic, has been amazing about sharing their passion for photography. In recognition of completing 20 episodes, we're going to do a best of, a greatest hits, uh, a sampler platter, an audio buffet, if you prefer, including a few moments that show me a little bit less than professional when moving my lips. Start over. While you're listening, feel free to give us your opinions on Twitter at BH Photo Video with the hashtag BH Photo Podcast. After recording several pilot episodes, deep tracks, let's call them, which might or might not see the light of day, one of our first shows was titled Are You Down With Drones? And it featured director, drone pilot, and founder of the New York Drone Film Festival, Randy Scott Slavin, who shared with us how he got down with drones and the rapid advances he has seen in the technology over the years. Yeah, you know, I mean, I got into it at the same time that you did. I mean... Really, the first generation Phantom is kind of what got me into it. Really, the way that the story goes, which is actually 100% true, is I I like watching skateboard videos. Uh, I've been a director for the past 10 years, and I always like watching skateboard videos because they're kind of repositories of really good style, and they're usually very fringe, which I particularly like. Uh, You always see interesting camera techniques, technologies, and whatnot. And there's one uh, video that I saw called Pretty Sweet, and uh, it started out with this shot that just literally blew me away. I mean, my, my jaw was on the floor. You know, I was like, how did they shoot that? It starts out as a close up on somebody's face. It goes over their head, across a street, over like a 12 foot chain link fence, down a corridor, up and down, up and down, around another corner, down a flight of stairs. And then it ends up circling this whole uh, group of skateboarders and going up into the air. And I, I was just dumbfounded. I was trying to figure it out. I was trying to figure out maybe they cut a hole in the gate. Maybe they're following them with some kind of like uh, gimbal system, steady cam that's attached to a golf cart. I didn't even, I had no clue, honestly. And I watched it over and over again and I saw a shadow and the shadow was like of like a flying camera. I mean, it was, you know, I was like, okay. <laughs> so I started looking online and I, and, I, and I was like, wow, this whole drone thing, flying cameras, what the hell? I mean, it, it was way more relegated to hobbyists and, and people that were kind of uh, just building their own systems. And I found the, the Phantom and that was just as the first Phantom came out. No gimbals, no nothing at that point. And um, I probably bought it here, I mean, at B&H and, um, I had one, you know, within the week and I started flying it immediately. And what's interesting about that time, as you kind of mentioned, is, you know, it was a lot more janky than it is now. These days, you know, you hook up, you have your your cameras hooked up to your phone, you have 17 satellites, you let go of the controller and it's literally, it is rock solid in the air, doesn't change. I mean, you can probably shoot a time lapse with no problems whatsoever um, and and maybe even very minimal post-production with any kind of camera motion. Back then, it was not even close to that and no gimbal. So, I mean, anytime you move the drone left or right, you had that camera motion in there. A tilt right would cause a tilt right in the camera Um, and I actually kind of really look very fondly upon that time you know the time that I spent really learning how to fly the phantom in the gimballess era or my pre-gimbal era (laughs) right back then you really had to learn how to like utilize the wind because oh, yeah. when you're when you were you know pressing your 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 aileron or your rudder or anything in any direction it would cause so much camera motion so you had to really fly up wind and let it you know the natural camera motion kind of drag it and um, there was a real art and finesse to getting any kind of decent shots at that point there still is i still think it is an incredibly difficult uh, art it was also kind of unpredictable i know the first say i'd say half dozen flights that i had they were really, really good. I was able to get the thing to shoot up, come down, and I, was, I remember I was playing around. I was having it hovering over a, uh, uh, a juice bottle that I had on the ground. I was getting just to tickle it and knock it around a little bit and then take off and come back down, and it was fine. 
and then I crashed it, and it never quite worked the same way. Uh, <laughs> well, they're not meant to be crashed. I mean, <laughs> let's be real. I mean, especially now that we have something like the Inspire. I mean, the Inspire is not meant to be crashed at all. Right. As soon as it falls, I mean, it's like it has that very delicate gimbal. All the gimbals are delicate, but that yes. one especially is hanging down off the bottom. And, you know, it's like as soon as it, it gets knocked, uh, any of the blades get knocked, and it's just going to fall. And uh, as soon as it falls on the gimbal, it's done. Well, so, and then, can you explain gimbals? Yeah, a gimbal... To put it in very basic terms, it's kind of like a chicken's head. You know how like you hold on to a chicken and you move it around and the, the head of the chicken stays in exactly the same place? Aha. Uh -huh. I'm hearing crickets here. I mean, all right. <laughs> no, no, I'm no, from no, New no, York no, City, no. so I don't really know much about chickens either, but I did know about this before gimbals. Anyway, <laughs> the, the, the idea is that basically that, you know, it, the gimbal through the use of motors, some of them in two dimensions, some of them in three dimensions, uh, counteracts the motion of the craft and the wind so that the camera is stable. Thank you, Danny. You've we followed with an episode on the benefits of a long-term photo project with noted trained photographer Dennis Lipsy, and one on the intricacies of the used camera market with b and own Chris Conte. We then welcomed photographer Harvey Wang, who had just released his book From Darkroom to Daylight, for which he interviewed legendary photographers about their transition from film to digital photography. He talked a bit about the importance of time spent in the darkroom and the idea that image making with film comes from the subconscious. You know, the fact of the matter is digital is a whole lot easier in a lot of ways. And Absolutely. Um, life is busy and it's just the way to go. Unfortunately, the time you save, you spend on a computer. And, mm -hmm. and I think uh, for me, the pushback eventually came is that, uh, okay, I'm not in the darkroom, but I'm sitting working in Photoshop for hours after hours and it, it just wasn't fun. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, well, did you find that the time in a dark room was fun or look, I mean, is that nostalgia for the dark room, which I think nostalgia is a big part of this discussion, but there were times when I hated being in a dark room and I just wanted to get out of there and go somewhere else. There were other times when I loved it. But, right. uh, yeah. It, it's just about headspace. But one thing I did realize that yeah, there's plenty of times the dark room is tedious, mm -hmm. especially if you, uh, you I know, like it's, it's all about everything being right. The music being right. The, Thank uh, you for bringing that up. <laughs> the music, the time. But the fact is you had this alone time, which you don't have um, in modern life anymore. Mm -hmm. You're always connected. You're always plugged in. You're always on a screen. You're always interacting in some way. Even if you're doing Photoshop, you're getting text messages. Absolutely. There's yeah. a constant barrage of things. So no, maybe it's nostalgia, but the dark room was quiet time mm -hmm. and al alone time. And... Um, I have two old, two grown daughters and two little, two small children, and I used to bring the big ones into the dark room, and I still cherish, and I think they do too, that mm -hmm. time together in mm -hmm. the dark room away from mm -hmm. distractions and screens and electronics. Yeah. No, I have, uh, I think we probably all have our kind of dark room stories or our, our times. No, you Not don't? Me. No, no, no. <laughs> I, well, look, I was, in, I spent exactly maybe six hours of my life in a dark room. Oh, yeah? I was the guy that shot a roll and then dropped it off at the okay. photo store. So. Right, right. Never for... Yeah, I see I'm getting nasty looks from, right. from oh, around the table here. I spent years it's in just, the dark room. It has to do with my age. There weren't a lot of yes. dark rooms. When, <laughs> yeah. And, John, you claim we were all about the same age. That's really not true. You know? okay. Yeah, no, well... <laughs> You look much older than you are then. <laughs> In my teens, they discovered that those chemicals are bad for you, and they kept us away. Right, right, right. You know, but we are living in, in an interesting time because photography from the very beginning was a chemical process that required a dark room. Mm -hmm. So when you say evolution, revolution, you know, it, photography is still photography, and people would argue that it really doesn't matter what camera you use. But I do believe that in digital you can emulate almost anything in film at this point. Mm -hmm. Maybe that wasn't true 10 years ago, but um, there is still a difference, I believe, in the relationship you have to the art if you are limited by 12 or 36 exposures, if you're forced to think and slow down. I th think looking at the back of a camera after you shoot breaks a flow in certain ways. Jeff Jacobson, who's famous, well-known for doing Kodachrome, working in Kodachrome, he pointed out that just looking at the back of the, the, the when he shot Kodachrome, it was the making of photography, making the pictures was in the subconscious. Mm -hmm. Whereas in digital, it becomes, it's brought right to the consciousness. And I think that affects the images you make. Mm. Um, there are tangible differences, I believe, aside mm -hmm. from the fact that film has a thickness right. uh, that you don't find in, in, in digital files. Something that you mentioned that I wanted to bring up, which is the idea of digitally scanning your filmed image 
And that's what in, I'm doing now. Is that what you're doing? And are we just defeating the whole purpose with this? I mean, I think that that, that is the perfect marriage of film and digital uh, is to originate in film and scan because hands down, you can do remarkable things with post-production and di printing. And if you start with a negative, which has this inherent grain structure, um, I, I, I think that um, all the people I photographed, David Goldblatt, the great South African photographer, Jerry Liebling, you know, mm -hmm. they're working in film, but they're loving what they can do with post-production and having the time, you know, we really began to hit our stride with episodes on documenting climate change with photographers Ed Kashi, Greg Kahn, and Carolyn Minostra. And an episode, Do You Have Gas, about camera marketing and new toys. We then did a really unique show on the history of the Leica camera company and how its owner Ernst Leitz helped Jews and other persecuted peoples escape from Nazi Germany. We were joined by Frank Dabbas Smith and photographer Jill Enfield, whose family was personally aided in their escape by the Lights family. The Nazis take power in early 33, and some of the first things they do are designed to marginalize, isolate Jews economically. So Jews in all sorts of work are losing their jobs, there are economic boycotts, so businesses are being lost. So the idea is to economically marginalize them, okay? And, and the rest of the what we call the Holocaust grows, in, in, but it all starts with isolating somebody. And when you've isolated somebody, then incidentally, you can make all the propaganda and because don't, people don't have relationships so much with, say, the victim, then your racist propaganda has more chance to succeed. So young people uh, are having trouble in school, businesses are going bankrupt. And these people know of Ernst Leitz's reputation as somebody who's caring, and they come to the factory. Also, he had many Jewish friends, and they come to the factory uh, asking for uh, apprenticeships for their children. And so we see this immediately. And at the time, for Jews to gain apprenticeships like this was extremely rare. Many Jews are really flailing. And Ernst Leitz, without hesitation, is taking on young men, in some cases young women, uh, short-term or long-term apprenticeships. And it's case by case. So he's trying to, to help in a way that's appropriate for each person's circumstances. And... Um, and there are many examples that uh, are in that I've discovered and 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 have probed in terms of my research, and there's some amazing stories of people coming to this country, coming to Britain, and then also having their passage paid for to get here, and having jobs here with Ernst Lights, you know, up on Fifth Avenue and other places. Uh, and, and, and it wasn't easy for Jews to get jobs, good jobs with Kodak or, and blue chip American com companies during this period. But a German company, their agency is, is, is becoming a, a, a source of sustenance for refugees. Which brings us to Jill Enfield. Yes. <laughs> for those of you who are wondering, okay, well, what's Jill doing there? He's been waiting uh, patiently. <laughs> Jill, can you tell us? <laughs> you have an interesting story. Your connection to this is really wonderful. Could you tell us a bit about this? I can. Um, so my grandfather um, owned with his brother uh, a store in Frankfurt, and they had five stores all together. And it was the house of gifts. But their main uh, stay in the store was really Leica cameras. And uh, so cameras, photographic equipment, radios, uh, technology. They took all of the uh, business owners to Buchenwald after Kristallnacht from Frankfurt. Right. And my grandfather and his brother were two of the people that went. And they kept them in a separate area. It was called Block 5. And all they did all day was sign over everything they owned, everything, so that they would end up with nothing. My grandfather and his brother got visas to come to the United States, um, 
but they had to, when they were let out of Buchenwald, they had to walk those five miles or eight miles or whatever in December to the train station. And then there would be Jewish women at the train station that would feed them and give them a ticket to get back to Frankfurt. But, um, you know, they were not young men. And, I mean, they weren't that old, but they were, you know, they weren't 20, and a lot of them were old, and it was arduous for them to do, to go through that. And a lot of them were very sick. And, um, well, my grandfather was very sick, and my my great uncle was... Uh, Gustav really suffered and had it, physical that was and emotional breakdowns from that experience and was never himself again. No, he never worked again. Yeah, you see, there were, there were Gestapo spies in the factory. The year ended with a lively discussion on the best cameras of 2015. We had Matt Hill and Levy Tannenbaum on board, and they shared their opinions on the offerings from Sony, Canon, and Nikon, amongst others. I'm just going to jump right in. Um, I think it's amazing that Sony's put out pretty much six cameras in two years and each one is a legitimate step up from the next. There is a reason why you would graduate from an A7 to an A7 Mark II or an A7 to an A7R Mark II or an A7S to an A7S Mark II. This is the kind of innovation which I'm not sure if Sony can actually keep up, but it's amazing to see within the first two generations such nice feature sets at the next camera level. And they have everybody else's attention too. Oh, yeah. It, it seems to be relentless to me. Uh, I think that they they absolutely have intended to dominate the market and they're putting every available resource into it. And it does have that special, wonderful thing of being able to mount practically any lens. So if you love glass in general, it's a great choice. Yeah, um, totally agree. And th this is actually – I'm going to take the same moment also to talk about the 5DS for a sec. Love the fact that Canon came with a 50 megapixel. I started off on a – I think it was a 10D and moved up to 5D when the classic body came out in a 5D Mark II. Um, so my love for Canon goes way back. And I love the fact that it came with a 50 megapixel camera. I'm just also really annoyed. <laughs> that, because? That they didn't increase any of the dynamic range on it or any of the, the color consistency, which they could have done. It's one of the reasons why I think the D810 and Nikon have been doing so well against them, even at the lower megapixel range. Bigger is not always better. You know, more of the right thing is always better these days. And that, that transforms into cameras and many other things. You know, like it's, it's well, this is going to sound weird, but it's how you use it that's most important and what people want out of it, right? So 50 megapixels might be totally appropriate for somebody who has to do billboards. That's fantastic. And even that's not necessarily true because we both know people who've shot with much lower resolution cameras and have produced billboards in similar size. But you can stand three feet away from it and have proper resolution. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. Yes. Exactly. Yes. Viewing distance. Viewing distance. No two ways about so it. So for your fine art photographer who just needs to print a, f uh, a four foot by six foot on a wall, right. which people are going to stand next to, that's, you're right. Probably paramount. You know, if you just need resolution, resolution then uh, you're going to need those giant file sizes, and you're not going to be banging away a couple thousand shots a day like a wedding photographer. We're going to be right back with some more greatest hits. But before we do so, we really love doing the show, and if you love listening to it, reach out to us at BHPhotoVideo, hashtag BHPhotoPodcast. We kicked off the new year with a podcast on creative tips and exercises for improving your photography. We were joined by Todd Vorenkamp and Jason Fulford, who co-edited The Photographer's Playbook. We then had episodes on how professional photographers using Instagram, the state of the stock photography business with former Getty photo director Rana Farr and Paul Melcher. And that was followed by Behind the Scenes at a Camera Blog with Jay Herman and Kevin Raber of Luminous Landscape. It was a great pleasure and a real kick to welcome Museum of Modern Art Photography curator Roxana Makochi and writer and CEO Stephen Mays to discuss the MoMA new photography exhibition, Ocean of Images. After a group outing to see the show, Stephen posed some great questions to Roxana. One of the contradictions in the show was that um, it, it is fixed. You know, it's, it's on the walls and on the floor um, of, of the modern and... That to me seemed really contradictory with the nature of photography at the moment. Um, 
I have to say, I was delighted when you said that the uh, that one of your pieces is going to be destroyed at the end of it because part of what we're not because I don't like it, but you know, part, <laughs> part of what you know the real experience of of imagery at the moment is its is its transience. Right. You know, it, we, we live in it as a stream rather than as a pool. Uh, it's constantly flowing, and this notion of of images coming, images going is is really very expressive. And I love that the modern should be doing that as just you know, showing for a second or a few weeks. Uh, you know, a piece of work. But the you know, contradictions to me were that photography is fluid. It, it is quantum. It does exist all the time in, in, in different forms, at different moments, to different people simultaneously. And yet here we are in the museum. You know, it's the conventional white wall box um, with images fixed, um, albeit somewhere in the loose stack that you can take off. But, you know, it's, this, it's a fixed installation. And this notion of... You know, an installation seems very contradictory with the essence of what you're, what you're even saying, let alone what's actually happening in photography at the moment. Um, you know, it's, it's isolated from daily experience. It's it's fixed in time and space. It will end. It's here. It's in this location at this moment, um, and it's tethered to text. You know, it just it struck me that you know all the ideas you're talking about f were very difficult to express in the in, in the actual exhibit, and I, I wondered, you know, if, if you. would you know, how you wrestle with that, because, you know, as you say, there's no particular online session for it. It's just, you know, it does exist as a physical show. It's true that I read online a lot, but I also read books and magazines to, today. And there is something about the objecthood of uh, works that are, uh, that are driven by the photographic uh, and again, I get back to the photographic because it's a difference between the photograph and the photographic. And I think that this exhibition, while it's, it happens in the galleries, it takes on many, many forms. Some of them are projections. Some of them morph into three-dimensional installations. Some of them are just a map-like. Um, some are takeaways that will disappear. Some of them are ephemeral uh, installations. I, I I saw that particularly, you know, the thing with the Mishka Hanna piece, yes. um, which which manifests in, in yes. the gallery in three forms. Yes, you know, and Mishka exactly. produced a book, yes, um, which is essentially um, a, a data visualization piece, right. which is really interesting. Yes, um, it's a fabulous piece of work, and yet in the gallery it exists as a book, as a video, and as a text. Correct. And I wonder, you know, it, is there something wrong with the book that? Yeah, no, you can't, but the book you the, can't is not available to touch. Yeah, it's behind I mean, glass. I think that Mishka did the video e expressly to show how many black pages you'll have. How do you kind of uh, even understand distance, you know? Um, but also to defy the rational Cartesian uh, kind of understanding of encyclopedias, which provide knowledge, right? Knowledge gathering that goes page after page after page that is just black. There is another piece I should mention that, in fact, well, first of all, this started as a marketing campaign, publicity campaign. Uh, they, the, the group started as a lifestyle magazine and then branched out in various other directions. But uh, this exists, uh, contributed not only a piece for the gallery, but numerous other pieces, some that exist online, some that uh, of them are on uh, uh, throughout the city. You know, they are dispersed. You have to find them. You have to know about it. There is no text. Um, so it's up to viewers who encounter them. And then there is David Horvitz's piece, which is quite exceptional because that is... Um, is that mood, mood disorder? Is this one? Mood disorder, uh, yeah, yes. Yeah. Which, uh, which exists online. This is a piece that exists online. We also have a representation in the gallery, we, uh, but, but it continues to exist online. It's viral. It will never disappear. So this is a photograph of the artist that he took himself uh, a picture, uh, a self-portrait of him with his head in his hands. And then that picture, he downloaded it on Wikipedia to the site of mood disorders. Within instance, it became viral. It was picked up by various other sharing uh, sites uh, and accepted as de facto. After that heady conversation, we got back to our roots with a very hands-on show about night photography, in which author and photographer Gabe Biederman provided a how-to on shooting star trails. What do you need for taking a perfect star trail photograph of soup to nuts? What do you need to get this picture? Stars. 
<laughs> yeah, that, yeah, yeah. Bottom line, you need stars. Lots of famous people. So, I mean, there's, some, there's been some good New York City two-star yeah, two trail star photographer. You know? Sometimes it's but, an airplane, sometimes it's a helicopter. Exactly, yeah. Sometimes yeah. it's Venus. Right, right. <laughs> now, you got to get to a rural location, again, where you can see the stars. And I know people... I know people talk about stars as well as the auroras. They're like, oh, you can't do it during a full moon. That's BS. You can. You know, yeah. just you obviously want to point away from that to the darker part of the sky. So if you can get to dark skies, and there's apps. There's a dark sky app, so find that. You know, the northeast is tough, but you can get a little upstate and, and find some stars. Um, so getting to that location is key. And then the fundamentals, a good camera, a wide lens, a wide and fast lens, whether it's a 24 to 70 2.8, you know, or a fixed wide lens, um, that sturdy tripod and a cable release. Now, this is one where I would say, hey, now's the time. If you want to stack stars, you want to get that, that cable release that comes with an intervalometer, okay? Because that's where you're going to program in some key features. Now, there's there's two ways to stack stars or to get star trails, so to speak, because A, stars start to trail, I would say, about after 30 seconds as a general rule of thumb. How far do you want to get them to trail? Those epic shots you see where the North Star and these great circles of stars, that's about an hour to an hour and a half. Okay, but the longest exposure isn't always the best exposure. Right. And, and, and you, we need to experiment and we need to look and assess the situation. So good stars trails, I think, start to happen really at about four or five minutes. And that four to five minute to 15 minute is, is really nice and realistic and still gives that wow factor. But again, if you want to get those epic ones, you got to you, you'll be committing to an hour, an hour and a half. And there's two ways to do it. Um, we haven't talked about it yet, but every camera has the function called long exposure noise reduction. Yeah, yeah. Okay, and now most of the times, this is defaulted on on most of our cameras. And um, I'll tell you to take that off right at the beginning. You know, that's something I go through my menu when I first get a camera and I turn that off because I don't need it. And I want to explore what the camera's capable of before I put sort of a lock on it, right? So long exposure noise reduction, you know, Todd talked about how noise comes from higher ISOs, but it also comes, again, from that processor heating up and, and, and how hot it is outside, we need to test our cameras and see what it is capable of. So oftentimes when I'm teaching a workshop, I'll have the students go to their hotel room and shoot just an interior, maybe include a table and do a test shot, you know, turn out all the lights in the hotel room and do an exposure for one minute, two minutes, four minutes, eight minutes, maybe go up to 10 or 15 minutes. And then you look at those images at 100% on the screen and see, look especially to the shadows because noise appears first in the shadows. And look at that and see when you start to see the noise and what was the temperature in the room. Maybe you can turn it down to 68 or find out what the temperature is outside, try to match it. But that's sort of the best controlled way to kind of test your camera, see what's capable of. Again, knowing your camera, understanding the camera, the lens, even the tripod, what it's all capable of is going to make you a better prepared night photography outside. And the last thing you want to do is find out all these things at 1.30 in, in the morning. In the dark. In the dark, out in the middle of a, yeah, with all kinds exactly. of weird, weird animals howling at you from the shadows. <laughs> the safer way and what most sort of quote-unquote professional night photographers do is they do star stacking. Um, and, and then what they'll do is, they again, know the parameters of the camera, know the temperature outside. They've tested their camera, and they know that in these conditions, it's okay to get a five minute exposure before noise starts to creep in. Now, if I go back to that intervalometer that's plugged in, and if I go a one second, if I program it in, a one second break, which is the quickest break you can have between images. So I set it for one second, I set it to, to if I wanna do an hour, so five goes into 60, 12 times. So I set it up for one second break, 12 shots, each shot for five minutes. I press go. And the camera's going to do the, to do the job. It's going to collect that information. I bring it back home. It's not going to stack it together internally, I guess, unless you have the, the Olympus. But you'll now, you need Photoshop. But you take it in, you do your work on the image, you bring it into Photoshop, and you can stack it. There's a very easy ways to stack it in Photoshop. It's by combining the layers and going in lighten mode. And doing it's and it's a beautiful thing to see happen. It's like back in the dark room when you see the image come up, 
when you kind of take 12 images or some people do it 30 second stacks because again the, it's hot out so they might do 30 second stacks so that'd be 120 shots so you better have a good computer <laughs> to process those files especially if it's a high megapixel camera but they then see it kind of pop up and stack up together it's pretty magical and, and fun and, and that's and that's how you get it and it'll be the cleanest star stacked uh, we follow that episode with what would become our most listened to podcast to date, a great back and forth discussion about Nikon and Canon's latest flagship cameras and the future of these large body DSLRs. Are these big cameras going away? I mean, are they the dinosaurs that we won't be using in three years? It's, it's a good question. Um, I think it would really like if we if we want to make the argument for mirrorless, I, I think there's a couple things we need to see from mirrorless. Although, yes, Sony just brought out an A6300, which is shooting a ridiculous amount of frames per second with no blackout, but the buffer's still not there. Um, it's yet to remain to see how just how spot on the autofocus is. Can it compare to these kind of cameras? I think it probably can. We're just going to have to see a massive increase in the buffer. Um, the big thing going for these cameras right now, I think, is more is actually their size and their bulk and their ceiling and stuff like that. I think I, I think it's also important to mention that both these cameras are equally well constructed. The integrity of both cameras is phenomenal. They are both weather resistant and they're both meant to be used as daily workhorses. Yeah, of so course. it's really it's it's the technical aspects, the specs. Yeah, it's the, it's the inner workings. I mean, they're 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 both very well sealed. Like like you said, they're both you know, really rugged. These are, these are made to take a beating. Mm -hmm. I think I want to target the point, which is, are these worth upgrading to? Mm -hmm. Number one, if you're making your money using these kind of cameras, I'd say both of these cameras are definitely worth the upgrade. If this is your, your source of living, both these cameras have tremendous advantages offered over the previous generation. That's true. But if you only shoot stills, I think the 1DX Mark II is not as enticing an upgrade as the D5 is for D4 shooters. I um, remember when the D5 came out, I was like, Oh, this is amazing compared to the predecessor. When the 1DX came, while we were still like, oh, this is a spectacular camera, we weren't as blown away, but it's still a great camera. So I think the original 1DX is still going to hang on if you don't worry, if you don't care about video. Um, well, the, the F8 across the entire sensor in for long lenses with, with um, extenders, I think for anyone who's doing sports or wildlife, which is a lot of these shooters. Or anybody who wants to put a teleconverter on a kit lens for that matter. Oh, right, which, which is Alan's <laughs> primary use for teleconverters. There's a good time to note that Alan is a great photographer, especially with Leica and stuff like that. Where did this come from? Um, because you're trying to put teleconverters on kit lenses. So Sean and I are going to have the rest of the conversation. <laughs> um, so as I was saying, so if if someone's shooting the 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 long lens kind of thing and they really want these these long lenses, the 1DX Mark II is for sure a great step up as as you can get that F8 now across the entire center, which is frankly ridiculous. I mean, that's insane. Mm -hmm. That's true, but it's still. It, I think it's still for a six thousand dollar camera. It's still going to be a hard upgrade unless you're making a lot of money, which a lot of these shooters are. It's, it's just they buy them anyway. It's like yeah, okay, the this new is one's a out, professional spot. Right, They've right. probably already had the one the originals for about four years, mm -hmm. so it's kind of the time to upgrade. Mm -hmm. And I don't think, re considering the market is professionals, I don't think these types of bodies are going to go away anytime soon. Recent shows have included a conversation with Blink CEO Matt Craig on innovative ways to find photo work, a chat on photography workshops with the directors of the Eddie Adams Workshop and Photo Quest Adventures, and a really spirited talk on wedding photography style with Christy Drago Price. One of John's favorite episodes was a conversation we had with Time.com photo editor Olivia Laurent and legendary AP director of photography Hal Buell on photo editing and the definition of an iconic photograph. You're still seeing every single day thousands of images and not just from the wire but like walking around town you're seeing thousands of images. With your phone you're seeing thousands of images. Uh, whether it's on Instagram or you're following the New York Times or it's everywhere. Um, and I think that affects the, um, the, the creation of these iconic images because, because since you're seeing so many images, you don't have time to reflect as much on each one of them and actually, I'd say, the, get to understand the power of that image. That would be the biggest difference, I'd say. Do you get numb by it all? Don't be thought. 
Well, being the oldest guy in the room with all you young fellas, let me paint two. <laughs> let me paint two pictures for you. By the way, thank you very much for taking You're over welcome. my role. I appreciate it. <laughs> Pre-digital, AP transmitted 120 pictures a day to newspapers. <laughs> if we had color, that took up three or four of those 120 pictures a day. So not much color went out. And I am known for having to tell people this transmission is coming and we're not going to send you more pictures. We're going to send you better pictures faster and better quality. We now send each paper close to 900 pictures a day and we transmit 2,000 pictures because they don't all go everywhere. And so does Reuters and so does Getty. Mm -hmm. So you're sitting here looking at 6,000 pictures today. Now, this is my feeling of what happens. When you're looking at 120 pictures, you look at every picture, and you say one time, oh, look at that. Isn't that odd? There's Marilyn Monroe standing on it with her skirt blowing. Oh, my, maybe we'll put that in the paper because it's odd. Not because it's important, mm -hmm. but because it's odd. When you're looking through 6,000 pictures, you necessarily have to say, what's the lead story? Obama press conference. What do you got in the Obama press conference? I need a two column. I need a three column. Now, I'm exaggerating. It's not, mm -hmm. I mean, there is a looking for pictures, but a lot of the serendipity is lost in the editing of pictures, I think, today because of the volume. But that's not going to change, I'll also tell you that. You think it's going to change a lot? Not at all. No, no. It's going to get worse and worse. It's going to get worse. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. We're going to wrap up our Greatest Hits Volume 1 album with a clip from our very first episode with photographer Ann Rong and former New York Magazine director of photography Jordan Shapps, in which Jordan outlines his keys to success in the photography business. Certain things are set in concrete, and that is the talent is paramount, number one, then comes the likability factor. It's a tough world out there. It's a fast world out there. People are not going to suffer people they don't like. And likability is not, oh, how good looking you are. Oh, that's a Prada shirt. It's what, what, what kind of connection do I have with this person? Can I send this person to uh, Gracie Mansion to photograph the mayor or do a video on the mayor? It's, it, it, it's how does this person comport themselves? And then the other thing, which I, is the hardest bite of reality, is the art only represents about a third of it. The second third is business. And the third third is networking. And where those three things overlap, that's called career. Ooh. There are three things that you want. I call them the three C's. You want credit for your work, cash for your work, and control of your work. Ooh, Who yes. owns your images? Mm -hmm. you, is it work for hire where you take the picture, here it is, now they own it outright forever, and you can't use it? Or if you're lucky, you can throw something up on your website? Or are you licensing them Big the difference. use of the picture. Yes. yes. Yeah. I ran into a photographer not long ago who had shot uh, Jennifer Lopez for a New York Magazine cover that I did. And face to face in Sam Flax's doorway, he said, you bought me a house in L.A. I said, what are you talking about? He said, resale on the Jennifer Lopez shoot. I made $350,000 <laughs> because we had a license. He licensed us one-time usage for the thing. So you've got to be careful. Now, some People will try and get you to sign a contract. Condé Nast is notorious for work for hire and getting signing a contract. But uh, you can uh, you it, when you just because someone puts a contract in front of you doesn't mean you have to nod and agree to sign. You can cross off certain things. And also going back to something we said before with your art, likability, trust, intelligence, uh, good naturedness, and business are the components that make a career. And if you just want to take pictures and not do any of those other things, marry rich and go out and take pictures for fun. <laughs> Well, on that. So here we are. In just a few months, we've touched on a lot of diverse subjects and have welcomed some really incredible guests who have offered some wonderful insights into the art and craft of photography. But I got to tell you, all this sounds real easy. It sounds silky smooth and terrific. But I want you to know there are reasons why you should not try doing podcasts at home. Here are some of them. Is it? it let me. Let me. Do, do, just you specific. Are the they from what I? Um. Uh. uh. <laughs> okay. Let's say I'm a performance artist and I want to get a space and dance for strangers. Yep. Yep. Well, uh, <laughs> w w uh, uh, there's, uh, there's a, there is a, there, I, 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 what was the specific question? Uh, <laughs> 
Hey. We love doing these shows, and if you love listening to it, reach out to us at BH Photo Video hashtag. I can't read what the heck this is. Looks like DHW Photo Flow West. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks for checking out the B&H Photography Podcast. Send us a tweet at BH Photo Video, hashtag BH Photo Podcast. Email us your questions or comments at podcast at bhphoto.com. <laughs>